Hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone on Facebook, and hello, everyone here at the Credo office. Thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion with Powerhouse Organizer and the National Director of uh, Women's uh, Working Families nope. Party, I, <laughs> Maurice yeah. Mitchell. You might have a good idea on your <laughs> Maurice, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Credo. Thank you to everybody who's watching virtually. Great. Um, so despite what political and economic elites have told us, mm -hmm. America is in crisis on multiple fronts, from enacting policies that undermine our civil rights, our civil liberties, LGBTQ rights, to the rise of white nationalist terror, and a uh, you know, flat-out denial of scientific fact about the threat, the real threat of, of uh, global warming. Uh, the Trump administration is attacking our communities and the very foundation of our democracy. We need solutions um, that meet the scale of today's challenges, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today with Maurice. Um, so for our first question, um, speaking for myself here at Credo, and maybe others um, I know on our team can relate, and maybe other organizers who are watching right now can relate, but it seems that as soon, ever since Trump took office, I've been spending the majority of my time as an organizer playing defense. Mm -hmm. You know, we've really been working hard to uh, block policies that are separating families, uh, to block uh, all kinds of racist uh, 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 policies and agendas that are happening, not just uh, as part of the Trump administration, but ha that you know have uh, are happening at the state level and the local level. Um, but of course, you know, I know that it is just as important to talk about what we stand for, um, as as important as being clear about what we stand against. So, you know, um, you've been at Working Families Party now for a little bit under a year, um, and it's been quite a, a significant transition. And I would just love to know kind of, you know, what have you done in this past year or so to make the vision of Working Families Party a reality? And, and, and talk a little bit about what that vision is. Sure. Uh, thanks for that question. And the only thing I would... I would um uh, the friendly amendment to the framing is that we're actually the world is in crisis, right? Not yes. just America, right? And I think it's, you know, I think it's critical for us to contextualize all these things past our borders, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the climate crisis, the, the rise of the right wing, right? The rise of the racist right, um, an economy that, um, if you look at, you know, if you focus on the Dow and unemployment, everything's great. But if you actually talk to any working person, right, then you know that people are underwater in debt. Mm -hmm. People are either underemployed or overemployed, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when I stepped into my role a few months ago as an organizer, I wanted to have as many conversations as possible with people all across the country. So I've been on this Blitz tour all across the country. I did 70 trips in seven months. Um, and I feel like what I heard both grounded me in the reality of the crisis, but also in the possibilities. Everyday working people, everyday working people's consciousness mm -hmm. are shifting in this moment, and people are taking the tools of their democracy in their own hands through protest, through a new type of sort of focus on electoral strategy that's outside of the parties, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have young people, people of color, women, people who have been on the periphery of power, right? Now engaging in these insurgent fights, you know, and you have this crop of, mm -hmm. of amazing folks in Congress, right? As well as folks on, you know, up and down the ballot, right? Folks in state houses, folks in, on, the, on the local level who have never um, traditionally had access to, to the reins of power, mm -hmm. who are now in places of power mm -hmm. and being disruptive fo forces, right? So um, my assessment is that in this moment of crisis, there's also a moment of opportunity for everyday working people to develop a multiracial populist alignment, mm -hmm. right, that could address and fight back that right-wing white supremacist populism, mm -hmm. that, that wave that Trump wrote in, right? Mm -hmm. So, and also it's really important that we don't center Trump, mm -hmm. right? So he rode a wave that um, under that wave are toes that were seated by both Democrats and Republicans, 
right? Mm -hmm. And this is the culmination of a decades-long strategy that mm -hmm. was well-funded, well-organized, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that sought to lock in the power, this, mm -hmm. this power of this niche cabal of the ultra-wealthy mm -hmm. and dilute the power of everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. And so, it's you know, you, you talked about the need to sort of um, disrupt near-term crises, mm -hmm. right? And part of the crisis making that's mm -hmm. taking place mm -hmm. is so that we're running around and we're, we're doing the work of putting out these fires and we have to because mm -hmm. our, our people's lives are on, on, on the line, mm -hmm. right? But, but part of that strategy is so that we're, we're so sort of, uh, so, sort of uh, overextended, putting mm -hmm. out fires, mm -hmm. that we can't get engaged in the chess match that's taking place, right? And so we also have to invest in the long-term chess chess match, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that decades, let's call it like a 40 to 50 year strategy. Mm -hmm. We have to think, clear, what is our 40 and 50 year strategy? Mm -hmm. So much of our focus is on 2020, mm -hmm. right? You know, as it should be, we need to create a united front that is opposed to Trump and Trumpism, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to defeat him electorally in 2020, absolutely, mm -hmm. right? But I'm actually more interested in 2050, mm -hmm. right? And what are the near-term things that we're doing one of them is defeating Trump, but there needs to be a lot more mm -hmm. that would lead to the transformation that we want to see in 2050, right? We need to have both conversations, right? Both end. Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, related to kind of looking uh, forward mm -hmm. and um, creating a strategy long term, uh, we saw in November that many of our progressive champions, specifically uh, Stacey Abrams, who was running for governor in, in, uh, in Georgia, um, had, uh, you know, election wins stolen from them because yeah. of blatant voter suppression. Um, so what are the ways that um, folks um, online and, and folks here, what can we do right now to protect people's rights to vote? Great. It's a, it's a wonderful question. And also, it is a great example of that chess game that they're playing, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes it's like kind of disorienting. It's like, okay, so they're doing gerrymandering and they're involved in voter ID and then they're obsessed with this tax cut and the, what, what are it's when you when you look at it through the prism of every single thing that the far right is focused on mm -hmm. is an attempt to dilute our power mm -hmm. and lock in their power then it all makes sense right um and the other piece is every little step we make every gain we make there will be blowback mm -hmm. right which is why I think the chess analogy is so appropriate, right? There's no way a amazing transformative black woman is going to be victorious in Georgia without blowback, mm -hmm. right? And there's no way that they're going to fight in a way that isn't fundamentally corrupt in order to achieve their ends. The thing that the... It's funny because the right wing closes it, clothes itself in you know, the Constitution and in law and order. But when it comes down to it, the way that they execute their out, the outcomes that they want to achieve, they're willing to do all types of crazy right. things that, that violate the Constitution, that violate the law, that, right. um, in order to achieve their ends. And what happened with Stacey Abrams in Georgia is a perfect example, right? And it is one indicator of what they're willing to do, mm. the lengths that they're willing to take, and it, it just, you know, I hear these conversations in liberal circles where people are so obsessive over decorum, mm -hmm. right? And, and I'm like, are you living in the same reality I'm living in? Mm -hmm. You know, we, like, we need to do everything in our power. We need to marshal all of our capacities, all of our heart space and head space mm -hmm. and resources and time in order to defeat the right wing, right? And, I mean, the, this is the fascist right wing. And this is a moral, call. it's a moral calling. It's bigger than, you know, any, any partisan directive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, this, is, this is our calling. This is our moment. And I want to tell my grandchildren, or my great-grandchildren, what I did in this moment mm -hmm. and what I was willing to sacrifice in this moment so that they will have mm -hmm. the planet uh, and they will have the country that they deserve. And um, we need to break out of you know, some of our delusions. Robert Mueller isn't going to save us, right? Um, we we, we yes. need to break, stop watching MSNBC on repeat, right? And thinking, ah, he's one, 
He's one indictment away from getting in. No, right. it's That's our right. duty to take our democracy in our hands and organize like we've never done before. Absolutely. I cannot agree more. Um, we don't need to actually see the full Mueller report to know that Donald Trump is unfit for office. Yeah, it's not We've like, known that for it, it, It's not like, like, yeah. like we need more evidence. It's not like, man, I'm patiently awaiting the right. full report so I can make up my mind right. on Trump and his fitness for office, right? Right. So, yeah, sorry to interrupt. No. But, I mean, I'm just like, where, what? You know, anyway. Well, <laughs> well I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up um, moral leadership yeah. and, and, and leading with moral clarity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the past um, couple of months, some of the boldest leadership, moral leadership, is coming from the new class of Congress people yeah. that our communities elected um, in November, who happen to be the most diverse the most progressive uh, group of Congress people that uh, voters have elected in U.S. history. Um, so, you know, what does that tell you in terms of, um, you know, voters came out in force. Mm -hmm. They made clear to the folks that they uh, voted for, the folks who won campaigns, that uh, there is a mandate yeah. to resist Trump. There is a mandate to lead with moral clarity to represent uh, all communities in their, uh, in their districts, in their states. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they won. We elected those folks. What does that, are there any insights that you could draw um, from those wins in November? Uh, meaning, what is now moving the base? Why now? And what does that mean in terms of kind of the uh, establishment democratic assumption that folks should be running on moderate platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so there's a, so uh, elections are like swamps <laughs> for confirmation bias, right? Mm -hmm. There's just so many data points out there, mm -hmm. right? That you could look at an election and see whatever your particular point of view is, right? Um, but the reality is, and you know, I've looked at a lot of data and I'm convinced that what, what um, November's election told us mm -hmm. is that, uh, number one, when you support grassroots progressives, and it's not just about identity, but identity is important mm -hmm. because many, many people have been in the periphery of power in this country for generations, for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And the excitement that's unlocked when women and people of color and LGBT folks finally are able to run and win mm -hmm. is unrivaled. So number one, identity does matter, but it's not just about identity. Mm -hmm. When you run on a people-focused agenda, mm -hmm. which is all it is, and you know, a lot of the establishment folks and a lot of folks in, in media articulate this as it's some far sort of crazy idea that we are determined that government works for people mm -hmm. and that government solves problems at the scale of the problem. Right? It's like, basically the argument is government shouldn't work for people and how dare government actually meet the scale of the crises that everyday people are in. That's ridiculous. That is what the folks mm -hmm. in the sort of mainstream Democratic Party and certainly the Republicans and everybody else are arguing, right? And what I feel is that meeting people where they're at mm -hmm. and articulating in a very popular, sensible way Mm -hmm. solutions to their problems mm -hmm. unlocks all types of energy. Mm -hmm. When you, when you uh, attach that to an authentic figure that looks like you and talks like you and has your experience, mm -hmm. like working class people who actually experienced debt, mm -hmm. right? That was so controversial, the fact, mm -hmm. fact that Stacey Abrams had debt, right? It's like, people have debt. I have debt, <laughs> right? How many people in the audience here have debt? I have debt. Right? Yeah, we have debt. Yeah. Um, and so real people with real solutions mm -hmm. who are authentic and then the last piece is the way that many of these campaigns were organized. Mm. People focused, you know, focused mm -hmm. on volunteer mm -hmm. energy, focused on, on small dollar donations, mm -hmm. refusing corporate donations, mm -hmm. refusing PACs. Mm -hmm. It unlocks all of this energy. So to me, it's clear where, where the ground is moving, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that is being articulated, I think, shows you the, the delusion mm that many of the, elite, the elites live in. Mm -hmm. They don't realize is that these are, these are centrist issues mm. for working people. 
how you deal with my health care, how my kids uh, have a pathway to college, mm -hmm. like fundamental issues that people deal with every single day, mm -hmm. right? Um, the fact that this is even controversial tells you how effective that decades-long strategy of the far right has been mm. in clouding the political debate. We're actually debating whether or not climate change exists, <sighs> right? So yeah. that, that shows you the, the sanity, mm -hmm. um, the lack of sanity in the political debate. And the, the, we're dra what we're doing is like we're dragging... Uh, the political, the center of political debate into some sanity so that we can have these policy discussions, like legitimate policy discussions. So I'm really, really excited um, about um, all of the folks in the freshman class. And because they came in on this independent mandate, mm -hmm. they're able to challenge precedent and decorum mm -hmm. and speak truth to power mm -hmm. day one, mm -hmm. right? They're able to do that because they aren't attached to the pharmaceutical lobby or the various other lobbies, or the, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, the oil lobby, right? They, mm -hmm. could just, they could just speak plainly. Mm -hmm. And um, it's amazing that witnessing working people, mainly women of color, mm -hmm. speak, clean, speak plainly on mm -hmm. the issues of our day, it, it, it is an indication of how insane our political culture is, that that is so controversial, right? right. That is the point of government, right? right? And the point of government, like, this is our government. This is the demos, right? Mm -hmm. So the point of government is to serve our interest. And the fact that asking, requiring government to do that is like, whoa, slow down. <laughs> slow down, Shay. What are you, what are you talking right. about here? Um, I think speaks to the madness of um, the, the elite conversation. And elites in media, elites in industry, political elites, they live in a different island. Mm -hmm. They are having, you know, sometimes I watch the, t the um, you know, the 24-hour news. I'm like, where, what planet are these people exiting and entering from, mm -hmm. right? And um, because the people I talk to, mm -hmm. uh, the people I'm related to, the mm -hmm. people I'm accountable to, mm -hmm. are having a totally different conversation, aren't caught up in the hyper-partisan mm -hmm. debate, aren't obsessive over ideology, trying to figure out how, how to protect their families, mm -hmm. how to feed their families, mm -hmm. uh, how to make sure that they have basic things like food, shelter, health care, and um, requiring that their government supports them in that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, this newest class yes. of Congress people, leading with moral clarity. We need more of that. We need more representation of our communities and government. We need all of that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, Working Families Party is doing powerful work, building a progressive pipeline of, of folks, organizers, folks from the community who uh, are preparing them to run for office. Mm -hmm. um, many, many of the folks that y'all worked with won mm -hmm. in November. Right. Um, but we know that getting um, our community folks elected is just step one. So what are the ways that we can support um, folks who are maybe, you know, in elected office for the first time to make sure that we can cons sustain um, this, this leadership uh, uh, class that we're, we're creating? That's right. It, fundamentally, we need to get organized, mm -hmm. right? So it's not enough to get people elected and then job well done. All right, go ahead. Take the ball, AOC. You got it, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, what is required um, of us is to, listen, once we get past, that, that, is, that is job number one, get them elected. Mm -hmm. And then the day after election day and the weeks after election day, we need to be organized in order to give people cover and mm -hmm. support when they, when they make tough decisions mm -hmm. and they take tough stances. So I guarantee you, every single one of those freshman Congress people mm -hmm. are experiencing all types of pressures to get in line. Mm -hmm. And that's happening in our state houses. Just yesterday in New York State, three really courageous women of color, and that is not coincidental, mm -hmm. um, spoke truth to power because, you know, right now in New York State, for example, they are um, on the precipice of passing public financing of elections, mm -hmm. which w will create a pathway for working people mm -hmm. to be able to run and win, mm -hmm. right? And as that's happening, 
Andrew Cuomo, the governor, the Democratic governor, is having a $25,000 a plate uh, fundraiser, right? And three, um, two state senators mm -hmm. and one assembly person called him out, called out the hypocrisy, right? And I guarantee you, in their conferences, there was hell to pay for mm. them demonstrating independence. It's our duty when we elect truly independent progressives, especially people who have traditionally not been in office, women, young people, people of color, working mm -hmm. people. It's our duty to, to build organization around them mm -hmm. in order to shore them up and hold them accountable, right? Because the drag of uh, those bodies towards that decorum I talked about mm -hmm. and that precedent and keeping quiet and keeping your head down, right? That drag, that centrifugal force will drag even the most principled person towards the status quo opinion unless they have another base of power, the mm. people. Mm -hmm. So it's required of us that we organize. And that's why through the Working Families Party, um, and this also is part of uh, my agenda specifically in the Working Families Party, is focusing on building a mass party. Um, in many ways, the United States almost doesn't have political parties in the way that many people experience political parties outside of That's this right. country. Mm -hmm. In some ways, if you wanted to be hyper, hyper sort of uh, cynical about it, right, you could, um, you could articulate what we have as two marketing schemes in order to get to 50% plus one, right? Um, but we do need political parties. We need political homes where working people could see mm. themselves, mm -hmm. right? Could acquaint themselves more deeply with their own power and could execute a working people's agenda. And so I'm trying to build that on the hyper-local level mm -hmm. with, with the Working Families Party so that when we get people elected, right, we have an army of people to hold them accountable and to support them. Great. Absolutely. Um, you know, I spent some of... Uh, volunteer time when I lived here in the Bay Area, every single election cycle, just working with uh, local candidates. And that was really the need, is once getting these folks into office, it's, it's tough to figure out bureaucracies. It's tough to figure out where the levers are. And, and it really does make a huge difference when the people power is behind you. Yeah. Um, so sticking with the people power theme, um, I want to switch gears a little bit mm -hmm. and talk about uh, one of the uh, uh, one of our progressive champions who is leading um, on um, a, a revolutionary idea uh, to really fight back climate change. So we we've seen Representative Acacia Cortez and the Sunrise Movement uh, build so much momentum around the Green New Deal. They're literally changing the political weather around what climate change reform looks like. Um, so, you know, there's some critics of the Green New Deal who say that it's an incomplete plan, um, who say that it's, you know, unrealistic. Um, and there's a lot of folks who, who support it and say that it's a clear path forward, it's visionary. Um, so where, where do you stand? Where does Working Families uh, Party stand okay, on the so, Green New Deal? So we're, we're deeply aligned mm. and we're so, like all, all Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is doing is her job. Mm -hmm. And it's the most radical statement ever, right? Um, it just, I mean, again, again, it shows you where our politics are, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this, climate, this uh, climate crisis, it's above and beyond politics, mm -hmm. right? And we all, the Green New Deal is saying, we need to meet this unrivaled crisis this global crisis, right, at the scale of this enormous crisis. So this is global and it's existential and it's, according to consensus scientific opinion, inevitable. Mm -hmm. All right. We need to meet that at that scale. That's all the Green New Deal is saying. So anybody that's opposed to it, they need to offer a commiserate plan, a plan that is mm -hmm. at that scale. If they can't, they need to sit down. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. If you're opposed to the Green New Deal, offer your plan that addresses climate change in, the, in a holistic fashion. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing about the Green New Deal is that 
it both addresses climate change, it addresses real, a real gutting out of our, um, of our infrastructure, and it addresses our, our, the fact that our economy is um, an economy that is built on debt, mm -hmm. and it puts working people at, to work mm -hmm. in a, at a significant level, mm -hmm. um, engaging in, in jobs that are, are meaningful to, to, to our lives, and it addresses the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So it does all of those things. Show me your plan that does that too, mm -hmm. if you oppose it. That is my argument to anybody that opposes the Green New Deal. Show me your plan, right? But they, they can't because they have none, right? right? And, um, and to me, that's morally bankrupt, mm -hmm. right? Because again, this is not about ideology. This is not about, th like this is, this is a clear global calamity mm -hmm. that every single nation on earth, mm -hmm. except ours, is, has full consensus. Yes, this is happening. Yes, this is serious. Yes, this is real. Right? We're the only nation that has deluded itself, mm -hmm. that there's a debate about this. Right? And so simply saying this is true, we have to do something about it, Mm -hmm. is the most contro controversial thing in the world in, in a place like Washington, in a place that is captured by global capital, mm. you know, Congress, mm -hmm. right? It is not controversial in the actual world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is our duty in the actual world, mm -hmm. right? And so we can't get deluded by, again, you know, the elite conversation mm -hmm. is a niche conversation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is a niche conversation global minority of people that have deluded themselves, mm -hmm. right? And the, the other thing about these folks is that they are aggressively mediocre in every way, <laughs> right? Yet they are at the top of government and industry around the world, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I, like, I loved the, uh, the college scandal, right? It exposed... Mm -hmm the mediocrity of this elite, this great elite that marshals our world and our economy into the future, right? It's like the emperor has no clothes, right? And so, again, if we want to save the planet, mm -hmm. we, the people, have to take our democracy in our own hands. There is no magical elite person somewhere in some office somewhere figuring it out. Mm -hmm. they're, listen, they're not. Right? Um, and if you think about the pathways to elite circles, right? Mm -hmm. These are, are pathways of privilege, mm -hmm. right? These folks are not that bright. Um, and so we need to interrupt this. We mm -hmm. need to interrupt this, like the little, mm -hmm. you know, these elite conversations that happen in Davos and other places where they pat themselves on the back about how yep. fancy they are, right? It's like there are like 3,000 billionaires, right, in the world who live like gods. There's maybe a few million multimillionaires that live like kings. There's all of us trying to figure out. And then there's billions of people who live at the edge of poverty. Mm -hmm. This is unsustainable, mm -hmm. right? The, the 3,000 godlike people are not the folks mm -hmm. that are going to write that mm -hmm. caste system. They aren't. It's going to be us. Mm -hmm. And so, again, um, one of the reasons why Working Families Party is creating pathways for working people, mm -hmm. people in that, in mm -hmm. the, the billions of folks who are just like, what's going on, into these positions so that we could interrupt this conversation. And we have, we have to do it with haste. Mm -hmm. We are running out of time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, people power... Um, what used to support progressive candidate, candidates is absolutely essential. Um, and part of, you know, participating in democracy is also using our voices and our power to hold politicians accountable when they let us down. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in, I don't know, maybe it's been a month now um, since the DHS budget deal and, you know, the whole government shutdown yeah. uh, fiasco uh, happened. Um, and, you know, Months. It was months of budget negotiations, um, months of advocacy from immigrant rights groups, from folks here at Credo, from Credo members, uh, to push members of Congress 
to do something about what's happening with family separation, do something about what's happening with Trump criminalizing, locking up immigrant families, immigrants, asylum seekers, uh, folks with DED, TPS, DACA. Um, and, you know, we forced Republicans to shut down the government again. Democrats appeared to be holding the line for a couple of, of rounds of continuing resolutions. And then ultimately, they ended up signing a DHS budget deal that literally handed $4 billion to Trump for his wall. Um, and we're seeing some of that uh, now come to fruition with the, the Department um, of Defense uh, now uh, releasing uh, money uh, for border barriers just this week. Um, and so, you know, in this kind of climate of putting out fire after fire, mm -hmm. what does it, what can we do, uh, you know, to hold uh, politicians accountable, especially our friends, especially folks who have promised to look out for our communities, who ran and won on platforms saying that they would look out for our communities mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, fail us. Yeah. Well, do not look to elected officials like, you know, with, with all the, with as much respect as I can, as I can muster, um, do not look to Senator Schumer or Nancy Pelosi for moral leadership. Mm -hmm. Just don't, right? Now, there are, there are folks who are focused on their narrow institutional prerogatives, mm -hmm. right? And then there's us, the rest of us, that have a moral obligation a moral obligation, regardless of the institutional realities, to do what's just, mm. right? It's our, like, these folks are, are reactive. It's our leadership that ultimately shifts the conversation, shifts the political stance, right? And so I think a lot of people have it, like, kind of flipped in the wrong mm. direction, where we're expecting them to muster mm. this moral leadership that we've never witnessed from any of these institutions in the history of this country, mm -hmm. right? It's not gonna happen. What could happen is for us, given, given the stakes, because we feel it more than, than they do, right? Um, given the stakes, we could marshal a unparalleled solidarity with one another and, and choose to meet the urgency of the crisis with the internal urgency. Mm. If there's families being separated at the border, I will do what it, look, look, look. We have like eight, maybe nine decades on this planet, if mm. we're lucky. That's it. What are you gonna do with yours? Mm. What are you gonna do with yours? Are you gonna kind of sort of spectate as, the, as these neo-fascists seek to completely transform the face of this country? Mm -hmm as corporations seek to completely capture our democracy and the democracies around the world, this is game time. Mm -hmm. So what are you, this is actually, this is a moment for all of us to have deep introspection. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. put, put those people aside, put mm -hmm. those institutions aside. And if we decide in this moment to break out of our little atomized, little safe boxes, and build real solidarity and connection across race, mm -hmm. across class, across gender, mm -hmm. right? In order to do what's necessary, those institutions and those people will fall in line because they're reactive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually our job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you know, uh, as, as an organizer, our responsibility is also to, to fight for and move people to believe what is politically possible. And that's, you know, uh, such, a, such a core part of our work here at Credo, core part at work um, at Working Families. Um, so this is the final question. All right. Leading into... Um, By the way, this was a lot of fun. Thank you, you so much. <laughs> this is a whole lot of fun. Yeah. And I'm, I'm personally just so inspired just listening to, your, uh, to you talk about your work. So thank you. Um, so this is related to kind of um, work that's already starting um, towards the 2020 election. Yeah. 
um, so many progressive champions and so many um, of our Democratic rising stars have thrown their hat in yeah. uh, for 2020. It's like a clown car. Who's yes, next? who's next? <laughs> They're piling all in. Um, <laughs> so what are some of the issues that you think folks who are hoping to win, um, who are running for national office, not necessarily president, but for national office, what are the issues that they absolutely have to address in order to meet uh, this uh, this base that was awakened um, sure. in November. Okay. So the, um, and just, just so I'm clear, like I, I, I run a political party. We will endorse at some point. Mm. Okay. We haven't yet. But this is the bare, the bare minimum of anybody um, in the primary. The bare minimum should be uh, them addressing health care. Right? And I'm not talking about mealy mouth. What, I'm talking about the whole, the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. Medicare for all or some comparable program mm -hmm. that actually provides total universal health care for everyday people, mm -hmm. period. Right? Um, you know, and I've seen some people talk about, well, you know, I, was, I support universal access. You know, it's like, you know, anybody could walk into uh, a grocery. Everybody has universal access to food. Mm -hmm. We don't have universal money for food. That's the problem, right? So let's not, you know, so we need that. Um, we, we also need um, a pathway to, uh, to uh, from, from K all the way to university education mm -hmm. for working people, right? That's essential, right? Uh, a $15 minimum wage, right? So radical that people get paid $15 an hour and an opportunity to organize with a union, right? Mm. So these are just basic. Mm. If we had them in place, mm -hmm. it would mean that people had the bare minimum for dignity, mm -hmm. right? The fact that the converse, the fact that, that this is being articulated in such stark terms, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh God, the return of, it's like people, people again in elite circles in media are having a delusional conversation about, about what these things are. This is, these issues mean that our government is attempting to meet the basic needs of our folks. Mm -hmm. So that's the bare minimum. On top of that, the candidate, the candidate that will unlock the energy of the grassroots mm -hmm. will speak about structural reform of our democracy and our economy, right? And I'm really excited to hear proposals to break up the, the large, um, you know, the large tech sort of conglomerates mm -hmm. uh, to break up the big banks, to actually get at the root of organized capital. Mm -hmm. the, that niche people, you know, those people that I talked about, yeah. the handful of corporations and billionaires that, you know, they're already very privileged and wealthy and powerful, but they're not happy with winning. They want it all, those mm -hmm. folks, right? Break up their power mm -hmm. in fundamental ways and uh, provide access to power and pathways to power to people mm -hmm. through making sure that our democracy works mm -hmm. and making sure that people could organize through unions and other organizations and build their power together, right? I think, so the folks who could demonstrate through their issue agenda how they're going to transform the economy and, the, and our society and, and, our, and our democracy so it actually works for everyday people, mm -hmm. that, that will be the candidate that I think will be victorious because that will be the candidate that will inspire the most working people. And so we'll be looking in our endorsement process, which it is going to be, you know, democratic and grassroots. We have a lot of folks in our base. Uh, but those are the issues that we're going to be looking at. Great. Well, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and for sharing your work with us here. Um, uh, do we have time for some questions? Looks like we do. Great. Let's do it. Does anyone have questions for Maurice? Yes. Yeah, I'd be curious, like, how do you walk the line between both having a party but also trying to lead a, a movement? I guess, like, we are more of like a organization, so. Great yeah. question. Great question. Okay. So. The question? so oh, yes. Yeah. So, so the great question from the audience is, how do you walk the line between having a party but then, but then also wanting to support a movement, right? And I think it's about the reason I took this. So I came from social movements, right? I was an organizer that was deep, deeply invested in building the movement for black lives, right? Now, social movements, when they're at their best, surface contradictions that have just been baked in to our society so much that we don't even see them anymore. So in some ways, what they do is they render the invisible visible, right? 
like the movement for black lives rendered the reality that we were living every single day as black folks about around state violence against us into relief so that we all saw it again, right? Um, now, parties have the ability, if we elect folks, to govern. Folks in government have the ability to, to answer those questions or to resolve those contradictions. So there are different types of energy, there's different tools mm -hmm. that if we could align, right, um, if we could have the outside pressure of the movements mm -hmm. pushing the boundaries of what's possible, that's the other thing. Social movements render the impossible possible, mm -hmm. right? Um, parties don't necessarily do that. But in many places around the word, world, there are social movements that are attached to parties. So there's a, 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 a natural balance between the forces that push the boundaries render the invisible visible, render the impossible possible, and then the second force, which is able to capture that energy, answer those questions, and resolve those contradictions. Yeah. So they go hand in hand, right? <laughs> Another way of, of answering it. I have a question. Yeah. My question is about 2020 again. Yes. And I love the way you talked about, you know, certain issue areas that, you know, different candidates have taken up already. Yep. But I'm interested in help with answering the question that makes me crazy. Yeah. Um, when people say, I want the candidate that will have the best chance of defeating Trump, mm -hmm. I am looking for a better answer to, to wake people up. Yeah, yeah. Help. Great. So oftentimes when people say, so the question was, how do I respond to um, this question of viability? We need the candidate that that is best positioned to defeat Trump? Well, two things. Um, it isn't binary. Defeating Trump and demanding that our government actually work for us is not a binary thing. Like, either we elect Uncle Joe and we just accept the sort of... That's what, I mean, it's code for that, yeah, right? That's right. basically what it's code for. It's like... Like, 90% of the people who say that are like, we should just elect Uncle Joe, because we think... He now, um, I actually believe that part of defeating Trump, because Trump has a movement behind him, part of defeating Trump is identifying who our movement candidate will be, right? We're going to need millions of people rolling up their sleeves, passionately organizing their communities, right? Um, giving small dollar donations every single month, mm -hmm. building a mighty movement to defeat Trump, and then using that momentum in order to advance a progressive agenda. Because we don't just need to defeat Trump electorally. Then, that's like job number one. Then we need to roll back all of the trauma yeah. that Trump has created. That's job number two. Then job number three, we're still not done, right? It's not like, it's not like before Trump, we lived in some fantasy utopia, right? Things were really hard for a lot of people before Trump ever put his hat in the, in the race, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's three things. We have to defeat Trump, right? We need to clean up his mess. And then we need to do, do the work of getting our economy and our democracy for the first time in our history to, to actually fun function properly for the majority of people. Right? And that requires a singular candidate that can mobilize people's hearts and minds mm -hmm. so that they'll roll up their sleeves in order to do all of that work. Because Trump has that, right? He has a lot of negatives, a lot of people don't like him, but his supporters are a part of a cult that will do almost anything mm -hmm. for him. And so I think it's important, if we're talking about viability, what we're, if we're talking about viability, then part of the, the viability metric is if you have that on the other side, then what is your countervailing movement, right? And I haven't seen Uncle Joe movement build, right? So I got some questions for him. I also have a lot of questions for him. I mean, he has a long record, and I have a lot of questions for him. Like, how are you going to inspire women and women of color when you, when you have the opportunity to intervene on behalf of uh, Anita Hill, you chose not to, right? Right? How are you going to inspire working people when you were involved in uh, 
developing legislation that weakened bankruptcy protections for everyday people, right? It's a fundamental question. And, you know, I don't want to just pick on him. Every single person in the race is going to have to respond um, based on their record. And, and, you know, like we, like people are like, yeah. some people are like, don't, nobody, no, no fight. Everybody, like, hold hands. That's not the purpose of a primary, right? I think what we need to make sure is that people focus on the issues, right? And that people focus on the contrast. And people argue based on their track record, how they're going to deliver. And we should demand that they engage in a rigorous debate. If they can't deal with one another on the Democratic side, they're going to get demolished during the general, right? So we don't need them to put on kid gloves. I hear all these people who are like, you know, no infighting. It's called democracy, right? All right. Great. Any final questions from the audience? All right. Well... This has been inspiring conversation, great. energizing conversation, and so much back. fun. Yeah, have me back again. This is Absolutely, great. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, so thank you again for thank joining you. us. Yeah. Um, and thank you everyone on Facebook for joining us today, and we will see you next time.